God bless you all for tuning in today. God bless you. God bless you, everyone. Um, welcome to Wednesday Bible Studies. We thank God for this opportunity to be in the presence of God. I want to uh, encourage you to share the links uh, with your friends and loved ones. Uh, today being uh, the last uh, day for the series of the end time is going to be a wonderful uh, time in God's presence. Um, so I want you to invite a friend, invite a loved one, uh, so that they will all join in as we study the conclusion of the end time puzzle series. Uh, this is the 10th um, episode. Now, I believe that you're going to be uh, blessed uh, tonight and uh, you're going to be empowered tonight. Let's get into prayer. Uh, let's get into prayer. Uh, if you're watching us from Facebook, if you're watching us from YouTube, whichever place that you are watching us from, you're welcome. God bless you uh, for tuning in. Uh, let's pray. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and we give you praise because you are God and King, the ruler of the universe, the Prince of Peace and the Lord of Lords. We bless you for who you are and what you have done. I thank you, O oh God, that tonight you come to unravel your mindset, your mandate, your intention for us, your children on this earth. That even in the midst of this pandemic, we'll still be assured of the place that we're going to eternally be with you. We bless you for tonight. Holy Spirit, let the teaching anointing flow tonight. Grant me the eloquence of speech, the ability to articulate. Give us all the articulation of mind. Give us the receptiveness of the heart. And give us the spirit to be teachable. We bless you tonight. We come against any resistance of the enemy, any works of darkness to bring confusion and confusion of mind. We pray that the spirit of God take preeminence and let the power of God reign supreme tonight in our meeting. We bless you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. amen. We thank God. We bless the name of the Lord. Um, you can only respond your amen by typing it. So I welcome everybody to be getting engaged um, as we go through uh, the series. It's very important. God richly bless everyone that is responding, uh, either on Facebook or on um, YouTube or on um, Zoom. We thank God for this night. I'm really excited tonight. Uh, because we've gone through um, um, 10 weeks, for that matter, uh, of uh, the series about the end times. It's been amazing. It's been amazing. And we give God the praise for that. Tonight, we end the 10th episode. And we are uh, dealing with eternity and heaven. Eternity and heaven. After the last judgment, after the final judgment, uh, the great white throne, we enter into eternity and heaven. In the book of Revelation, chapter number 21, and verse number one through to verse number five, it says, now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice. <clears throat> from heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men 
and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people. Glory be to God. This is amazing. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. They are true and faithful. When we talk about eternity, um, we are talking about a timeless realm, a timeless realm. Eternity is timeless, it's timeless realm. That is what eternity is. Uh, anytime that we speak of heaven and what will take place um, in the last days when, when we enter into eternity, uh, there, are, there are many uh, misconceptions or ideas that come into the head of people. Uh, there are those that believe there is no heaven and there is no hell. Uh, uh, but tonight we'll be looking at the like strong three questions that many people ask. You know, um, for example, uh, a question like, uh, "What would our body look like when when we go to heaven? Uh, what would we do?" when we go to heaven? And uh, a question like, uh, would we recognize each other when we go to heaven? And um, we're going to be tackling these uh, strong questions, strong questions that I believe that a lot of people keep asking, what are we going to do in eternity? I mean, what are we really going to do there? And there are those that don't want to think about it. They don't believe that it is there. Um, but the Bible, the Bible is very clear. Uh, Paul spoke uh, about it, said to be heavenly minded. He said a Christian must be heavenly minded than earthly minded. So um, it is very important uh, for, for us to be heavenly minded, to think heaven and not just always be just earthly minded, but we have to have a destination in view. Um, I remember when I was a young uh, boy, we, we were taught a song in Sunday school. I have another world in view. Uh, my savior has gone to prepare me a place. I have another world in view. So you have to have heaven in view. You have to have heaven in mind. But as I said, there are those that don't believe in heaven, nor hell. They will tell you it's all make-believe. It's just an assumption. There's people making things up. Uh, there was a scientist that was a Russian uh, called... Uh, Isaac Asimov, and uh, he once said, I don't believe in an afterlife, so I don't have to spend my whole life fearing hell or fearing heaven even more. For whatever the tortures of hell, I think the boredom of heaven would be even worse. So there are people that have the mindset, and this is coming from a scientist who was predicting the future in, in some time to come, even the kitchen will make food for you and prepare food for you. Uh, he had uh, a whole lot of things that, uh, some part of it, uh, we see um, glimpses of it, but most of the things that he thought it was going to happen has not happened anyway. But this is the mindset that Isaac Asimov had. And now that he has, he has died and gone, well, if he has not, if he didn't meet Christ because he was an atheist. So uh, as a typical atheist, that is the, the, the concept of ideas that uh, he's going to have. I don't believe in an afterlife, so I don't have to spend my whole life fearing hell or fearing heaven even more. For whatever the tortures of hell, I think the boredom of heaven would even be worse. So he had the mindset that even if there is heaven and heaven and hell, heaven will be more bored. It will be full of boredom. 
It will be the epitome of boredom, whilst hell will be the place of fun. You know, we're going to have excitement. It's going to be great. It's going to be wonderful. So there are people that have the mindset that, you know, <laughs> hell is going to be wonderful and it's going to be great and we're going to be partying and there will be partying in hell and all of that. You know, taking in liquor to the to the to the point you puke your gut your guts out, and all those kinds of <laughs> mentalities that people carry. And when when people think about heaven, they are thinking about, oh my goodness, it's going to be a place that is so boring, just going to probably sleep throughout the whole time till our body hurts. Uh, just going to just only maybe do worship, 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 worship. It's just going to be just boring, you know. But these are the ideas that a lot of people have, okay? But one thing that you have to understand is that the last thing heaven is not is that it is a place of boredom. The last thing heaven is not is that it is a place of boredom. Heaven is a place of bliss. It is a place of bliss. Heaven is a place. Heaven in itself is a place, okay? So heaven is a place of bliss. Heaven is a real place for real people who do real things. It is a place for real people who do real things. So the Bible, the Bible declares that heaven is a city. It is a country a garden, but in a, in a nutshell, if you put a city, a garden, uh, a country, it is a place. Heaven is a place. It's not just a city. It's not just a country. It's not just a garden. It is a place. So heaven is a place of reuniting with loved ones who are believers, eating, worshiping. So that is a place that you're going to reunite with loved ones who knew God or who were believers. So if they are not believers, you're going to see them go to the lake of fire for eternity. But in eternity, you're going to be reunited with loved ones who were believers of God or believers in Christ. Write this down. Heaven will come on earth. So when sometimes when we talk about the heaven, um, people are looking at it from um, a place that is separated from the earth because um, <clears throat> we have a mindset of the way that we view heaven. We see it from the earthly mindset infusing into heaven. But it is not that way. It is the, the things that we're experiencing now is a glimpse, okay? Just a glimpse, a little, a little flash of what the fullness of heaven is going to be like, okay? So heaven will come on earth. There will be an infusion. There will be an infusion. So if you talk about heaven, it's not going to be something hanging out in the skies and we're sitting in the skies and playing with the clouds. <laughs> it is going to be infused on the, uh, with the earth. Okay, it's going to be heaven on earth. You remember Jesus, the prayer that he prays, your will be done on, uh, on earth as it is in heaven. So this time it will be an infusion of the heaven on the earth. And heaven and the earth will become one. There will be no separation. It will become one. It will become one. Heaven and the earth will become one. There's a man called uh, Joseph Hill. And uh, he was also one of the atheists. And he said this something. I don't believe in the sky bully, referring to God. That God is a bully. So there are people that have the mindset that these things are just... Um, I, I, you know, ideologies that are man-made and I don't want to sit under a God that seems to want to bully me around, tell me what to do and all of that. I do what I want and nobody tells me what to do. But it is very important to have as a Christian 
to have heaven in view. I know that we don't think about it all the time, but you have to always try to have heaven in view, have, the, have heaven in mind, because that's where we'll be going. It says, your belief in the afterlife has everything to do with how you live in the before life. So whatever that we're going to do, whatever that we're going to be, is predicated on how you live in the before life. So your belief in the afterlife has everything to do with how you live in the before life. So if I believe there is heaven, it's going to affect how I live in the before life. Okay. You can be so earthly minded that you won't be heavenly good. What do I mean by that? When you are so earthly mindedly bound, you, you set your life only on the earthly things and not having heaven in view, which, which means that you will just live life and thinking that life is just here and after here, I'm just going to go sleep, 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 and sleep. That is the mindset of many. And when you have that kind of mindset, you will not live a life that will qualify you into the heavenly realm. Because the focus of the earth realm is mainly, mainly centered on the, the human without God. But when you are centered with God, you will be infused with the mindset of heaven in view. Because I have a heaven in view, my steps and my life is always wet out on the grounds of where I am going. Nobody, nobody um, travels without preparing. Nobody does that. Okay, you prepare before you travel. Okay. The way we view the by and by uh, affect the way we view our here and now. So how I'm going to view the by and by, the future, I mean, the, in, in the eternity in heaven, I'm going to view it is how it is going to affect my view of my here and now. And so there are many Christians that if our mindset is just on physical things and physical things and physical things and physical things, your, your view of heaven will be diminished because your life will just be centered on, I want to get this and I want to get that and I want to get that and I want to get that without having a heaven in view. Because after getting this and getting that, know that those things are flash. They cannot be compared to the greater things that is going to be experienced in eternity, in heaven. Okay? Our feet must be on earth, but our mind must be in heaven. So even though, as I said, I'm walking on the surface of the earth and I'm doing what every human being does, moving around, my mind must be in heaven. My mind must be centered in heaven. Now, I'm not talking about the skies, but the heaven that is infused on the earth where we're going to live in eternity. Where we're going to be living in eternity. Heaven is not an imitation of earth. Heaven is not an imitation of earth. A lot of people think that, you know, the reason why we have so many different types of questions and, and ideologies is because we think that heaven is an imitation of earth. But earth is rather the imitation of heaven. It is, it is a glimpse, a, glim, a glimmer of imitation of the fullness of how heaven is going to be. But the fullness of heaven is not revealed in, in the glimpses of what we see on this earth. So it is very impor important for us to understand that heaven is not an imitation of earth. Never even close. Okay, C.S. Lewis said, all the things that ever deeply possessed your soul have been but hints of heaven. 
That is how C.S. Lewis says. He says that all the things that ever deeply possessed your soul have been but hints of heaven, tantalizing glimpses, promises never quite fulfilled. So he's saying that the things that we see on the earth are the tantalizing things and glimpses of promises that are never quite fulfilled, but they will be fully fulfilled or you will fully have the experience of, of these great things when we enter into eternity of, in heaven. That is amazing. That is what heaven is about. So I'm going to look at this and answer the three questions. Um, what will our new bodies be like when we go to heaven? Are we going to be spirit beings walking around? Uh, there are people that have the mindset that in, <laughs> in heaven we're going to, some people are going to be doves and people are going to be turning into angels and uh, things of such nature. Um, if we are turning into angels, then we are not going to be responsible for uh, the, the rewards of the earthly realm, of the, of the old earthly realm. So um, um, when people say, oh, yeah, the person died and now the, the person has been transmitted into another um, being and he has become like an angel and he's like angel in heaven watching over us and a whole lot of things giving a godlike uh, position to people who have who have passed away so there are a lot of mindset or questions about what what will our body our bodies be like in heaven uh, the blueprint for our glorified bodies are in the bodies we now possess the blueprint for our glorified bodies are in the bodies we now possess, okay? So heaven is the earthly life of the believer, glorified and perfected. That is what heaven is. Heaven is the earthly life of the believer, glorified and perfected. So in heavenly realm, we are, we are, we are, living the glorified and the perfected life that was intended by God, or that is intended by God to be lived by us as people. Amen and amen. This is, this is wonderful. So Paul says something to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 15, 43 to 44. It says, it is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. Talking about the body. The body is sown in dishonor. What does that mean? When you put a seed in the ground and it germinates. So we came out of our mother's womb. We are sown onto the earth. So we came out onto the earth. All have sinned and have come short of the glory of God. So that is the dishonor. But it is raised in glory. That means that when I go out of this world by accepting the Lord as my personal savior and being in connection with Jesus Christ, though I die, I will be raised in glory. It means that I will have the perfected body. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. So the body that was once weak, like this one now, when we are resurrected, then we shall be raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. Now, let us understand here that when we talk about that spiritual body here, we are not talking about something you can feel or touch, but it's an infusion of the natural with the spirit. What is, in, what is the real you? Okay, the real you is, the, is, the, is the, the spirit within. And so when, when, the, when the spirit departs, the body that is lying down cannot do anything. It needs the spirit in order for it to be able to move around. So when, the, when you get the glorified body, uh, that is what I call the radical improvement. When, when, when we are entering into uh, glory through the rapture, if Jesus comes uh, right now and then the, the, rapture, the rapture takes place right now, we are going to be given a glorified body. We are not going to enter with an imperfect body. This, this body will be upgraded. There will be a radical improvement on this body. 
So there will be no more uh, physical disabilities. There will be no more aging. In that glorified body, there will be no more aging. There will be no more sicknesses. There will be no more disability. So if um, uh, for some reason I was born without legs or without arms, I will be given arms, legs, and not just that, but improved version of this weak body. So it will be the perfect body uh, that is infused with the spirit. You remember when Jesus died and rose up again on the third day, uh, the, Bible, <laughs> the Bible declares uh, something that is very emphatic. The Bible says that he appeared before the disciples and immediately he appeared before the disciples. They said, he is a ghost. And then Jesus said, come, feel my body. For a ghost does not have a body. You cannot see a ghost. He said, a ghost does not have a body of which he can feel. That stands to reason. And he came through without opening the door. He came into the midst without opening the door. And it wasn't the first time. It wasn't the second time. So we will have the glorious body like Jesus being the, being the, the prime example of a resurrected, glorified body, the higher version, that is the body, the kind of body we're going to have. That is the kind of body we're going to have. Jesus walked through um, barriers, appeared, and it wasn't a ghost. That is the higher level. So it's, it's, an, in, it's an infusion of the natural with the spiritual that allows us to see God. That will allow us to see God. Watch this. In the book of 1 John, chapter number 3, and uh, verse number 2, it says, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. It has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. We shall see him as he is. So we will, God will not be hidden from our sight. We'll be able to see him. The reason why I know that this is going to happen, as scripture has said, is because now we go through a lot of things in order to be able to have an experience with God, all stemming on the fact of the sin nature that corrupted this body and made it impossible to connect to the things of the spirit in the natural way that it's supposed to. Because the Bible clearly says in the book of Genesis that man was having a communion with God. There was no complication in Adam and Eve having um, uh, seen God and having that uh, um, connection and communion with God. But immediately you come to Genesis chapter number three and verse number eight, the Bible says that, and Adam said to God that I heard your voice and I heard myself. So now he heard the voice, but he didn't see God. He said, I heard the sound and then I, I hid myself. But in this very point, he says, we shall see him as he is. We shall see. That means that the infusion of the flesh with the spirit gives us the, the, the ability to see God, like the glorified body that it's going to be, because the body wouldn't be corrupted anymore. It will not have disabilities anymore. It will not be weak anymore. It will have the capacity to, to, to see God, experience spiritual things, even, even, even though you are built with a natural thing, because that is the way we were. In, in Eden, that was the way we were. So you need to understand understand this. If Jesus, Jesus right now is sitting um, with the Father, beside the Father, which means that he's seeing the Father, he is communicating with the Father with that same glorified body that he came onto the earth with, and then the one that he came with the earth with, and when he died, he got he put on a glorified body, which was able to ascend into heaven. 
that abilities are in the the radical improvement of the flesh so it means that we have really downgraded this because as a result of sin it has downgraded the abilities that is infused by the spirit to the flesh of the man of the body of the man so when paul spoke about this he was speaking about what has already been uh, emphatically uh, done even naturally by jesus christ when he came onto the earth that after his resurrection he took on a glorified body so you remember he said to um he said to uh, mary magdalene you can't touch me i have to present myself before the father i have to present myself before the father and then he came after he came before the disciples and said now you can touch me if i am not really real so the glorified body is going to be a body that can go through walls if there will be walls at the time but it gives us the ability to to enter god's presence without having to uh do tons and tons of things before we can really get uh into the presence of god and really try to um experience god's presence is going to be so natural because it was our nature before it was our natural realm before before sin came into uh, the world so we shall see him as he is that is what is going to happen here we shall see him as he is and second corinthians chapter 5 verse 1 through to verse number 3 says for we know that when this earthly tent we live in is taken down that is when we die and leave this earthly body we will have a house in heaven an eternal body made for us by god himself and not by human hands we grow weary in our present body and we long to put on our heavenly bodies like new clothing for we will put on heavenly bodies we will not be spirits without bodies did you see that we will not be spirits without bodies so if you if, if people carry the man said that you know in heaven we just going to be spirit and we need in the flesh and all of that this is very clear here you going to have an improved the, the the version the higher version of this this flesh that we carry now there will be the correct version your face will not change or anything like that you still have your facial um uh, the way that you have made the physical flesh you're going to have all of that because if jesus had changed if jesus when jesus rose up from the grave and he came out to his disciples with his body how did they recognize that this is jesus they were able to recognize him because he was in the same flesh but in and uh, the improved version the version that connects us and gives us the ability to see god to have to see angels to connect with everything spiritual and physical that is how amazing it is going to be and satan took that away from us from the beginning but we're going to get that if you believe that say amen to that amen and amen glory to god the real you is not just the body but the soul and spirit that gives you the personality so the real you the is not just the body it is infused as i said by the by your spirit and your soul uh, and and it gives the the personality the 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 system of the way that you're going to be now in heaven because there will be no more sin no more, there will be no consciousness for sin but that does not mean that you will not be conscious of everything we're going to find out so when when people think that in heaven we're going to just be there with, with our spirit and uh, and so that there, there is that uh, deception that you know if they say i'm going to burn in the lake of fire well it's going to be my spirit it's not going to be this flesh so i won't feel anything and i wouldn't care about it because i'm already dead and gone <laughs> you know you will feel everything you will feel everything because it is going to be the body will be resurrected and eternity eternally destroyed in that lake of fire and on the other side it would be the the believer who is sitting in a glorified body and enjoying God's presence it's going to be amazing the second question uh, that comes out a lot is will will we recognize each other in heaven 
will we really recognize each other in heaven? Or we all be in the days, you know, like in this strange um, la la land or this strange kind of uh, hypnosis where we would not know our left from our right. And by that, would we be able to recognize each other? Well, the answer is an absolute yes. We will be able to recognize each other in heaven. You will be able to recognize each other in heaven. Last week, I spoke of the fact of uh, what Jesus spoke about when he spoke about the story of Lazarus and the rich man. The rich man recognized Lazarus. He recognized him because he didn't lose his, 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 his intellect. Because your, your, the center of your memories and all of that is not just scientifically woven in the brain. So when you die, then it also dies. No. It is in a spiritual wire manifesting in a physical body. So though the physical brain, the physical brain you can touch that is in the head is dead, does not mean that the mind is dead. It's a spiritual thing. Nobody can touch the mind. It's a spiritual, it's a spiritual thing. It's something that you cannot see. You can see the brain tissue, but you cannot see the mind. So you cannot, uh, we cannot uh, misunderstand that. It is an absolute yes, we are going to recognize each other in heaven. Heaven is not a state of mind or someone being in a daze. So sometimes you say, oh, well, heaven will be a state of mind. Heaven is not a state of mind. Heaven, and, and, and it's not just also someone being in a, in, in a daze or under some hypnosis, but you're going to recognize each other. First Corinthians chapter 13 and verse number 12 says this. It says, now we see things imperfectly like puzzling reflections in a mirror, but then we will see everything with perfect clarity. We will see everything with perfect clarity, including God. You will see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete, but then I will know everything completely, just as God now knows me completely. So you will know everyone, Everyone that you knew on this earth, you will know them. You will remember them. You will not lose your, your um, memory or your mind. You will know them according to scripture. Okay. We will know them. We'll know everything that we had questions about and we didn't understand. Uh, there will be clarity. It will be perfectly clear. You will understand it. Sometimes people say, okay, so when you see your loved ones going to um, the lake of fire, uh, would, you, would you be so much broken and all of that? No. You will clearly understand why they are going into the lake of fire. And there will be no sense of attachment in that sense of feeling uh, uh, sorrowful or broken for them because then you will understand in clarity why they chose that part and you chose the side of God. There will be clarity, perfect clarity, according to scripture. You know everything completely, just as God now knows me completely. So you, everything that, that is mystery will be demystified, fully demystified. All questions will be answered. All questions that are not clearly answered will clearly be answered. Everything that you think is crazy, there will be clear answer. You will understand everything. There will be no more mysteries. As I said, there will be no more mysteries. There will be no mysteries. You will still know your family and friends. You will still know your family and your friends. You will not lose your brain. It's not a state of mind. It's not someone in the days. You will know your family and your friends. There will be stronger and sweeter love. Stronger and sweeter love. It's not the love of Eros, but it will be a phileo uh, love. The, the, the love that is brotherly. And you will see the depth of it. We will have the fullness of what love is. 
now what we experience is somebody who says, it will not just it will just be like uh, something that I might not be interested. You realize that when we enter into that realm, there will be that perfect love of God that is being um, experienced by us and towards each other. It will be deeper than what we see. It will be greater, much powerful, more glorious than this little thing that we see around. There will be no more break in your love and or your, the break in your thoughts. You know, so we'll not break in somewhere and say, well, I don't love her anymore. I don't love him anymore. I, I don't like him anymore. There will be nothing like that. There'll be no break in your love and break in your thoughts. It's not like, mm, I don't remember. Oh, I don't remember. There'll be nothing like that. There will be no break in thoughts and there'll be no break in love. Everything will be perfectly clear according to scripture. You will know everything completely. That is what it is. You will know everything completely. So it's not, ah, I forgot, I didn't, I don't remember that. No, there will be a clear memory. Perfected, listen to this, perfected body infused with the spirit. That is the height of God's version for man. Not this state of depravity where we are, we are so weak in so many angles of our lives. This is not God's expectation for man. God has a high expectation. That's why he said, I do exceedingly above what you can even think or ask for. Because the realm, the realm that we operate from is lower than God's expectation and God's greater idea for man. Okay, so it's going to be a wonderful thing in eternity, glorious in eternity. Okay, you will still be you, but the perfected version. You will still be you, but the perfected version. So don't think that, oh, I'm going to grow wings and become an angel, and I'm going to have six wings like the, 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 the seraphs in the Bible, and I will have 10, 20 billion eyes around my body, please. You're going to be still you, but the perfected version. Do you, do you sometimes, you know, sometimes when we read scripture, sometimes we, we miss certain things in scripture. On the day of transfiguration, the Bible says that Jesus went on top of the mountain uh, with Peter, James, and John. And the Bible clearly declares that whilst they were with Jesus, they saw him transfigure. They saw him change. And then whilst they saw the change, they saw Elijah and they saw Moses. Now, the question is, how did they recognize that this is Moses and this is Elijah? Or did they come with name tags on, on them that says, hey, I'm Elijah and, and all of that? I believe that in that, in that uh, split of time, they were, they, were, they were experiencing a full knowledge uh, uh, of knowing something from the supernatural realm. So they were able to recognize that this is Elijah, this is, this is um, Moses. Because it wouldn't be like Moses was holding the Ten Commandments in his hand and say, yeah, I'm Moses, you recognize this? Then you'll be able to know that I'm Moses. Or they didn't see like Elijah hanging out somewhere with, uh, with the 440 uh, bill prophets uh, and he's standing there with, a, with a, an altar uh, with a bull on it and say, recognizing this? I'm going to call fire on it. Guess who I am? I don't think so. They got that glimpse of knowing. So you will still be you, but the perfected version, the high version. So you will still recognize each other in heaven. Now, the most poignant question that many people ask a lot is, so what would we do in heaven? What would we do in heaven? I think that this question has been asked to me <laughs> so many times. What would we do in heaven? And some people say, well, maybe in heaven we're going to play golf. Or we're going to play soccer. We're going to have some swimming competitions. And we're going to play chess. And we're going to do all the favorite games. And I mean, people say a whole lot of uh, <laughs> interesting things. Um, in as much as it might be, I'm not saying that, but I'm talking according to what scripture states. What would we do in heaven? Number one thing that you got to understand, we will be worshiping. 
we will be worshiping. Now, a lot of people think, oh, no. So we're going to just spend all the time, eternity. There is no time frame. You know, that you just, we're just going to be there and worshiping and worshiping and worshiping and worshiping. The level of worship, we have not attained it. What we experience on the earth realm now, as we, we, we think it's worship, is just a glimpse of what worship is. In Revelation chapter 15 and verse number two, it says, and I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire. And those who, were, those who have the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God, they sing the songs of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. So we will be worshiping. There will be a great worship. That is what we are made to do. We are made to worship. Don't forget that. You know, a lot of the times, as I said, we struggle in worship because uh, we are in a corrupted body that always is worrying about something, um, anxious of something that I don't have, um, sicknesses in the body, uh, strange attacks in the body. So all these things attacking us because of our frailties in this version, uh, it makes us not be able to uh, worship in the realm of what worship is about. So the actual experience of worship, we have not even gotten close to what worship is all about. But we are made to worship. So that stands to reason and to understand that what we are going to be doing in heaven when we are worshiping, at that time, you'll not be worrying about painful knees and, and uh, you know, lifting up your arms and you feel pain under your arm and, and, you know, you can't see well, you're having some headaches and the sound is loud or too low or, uh, you know, I don't like this kind of music and I, what kind of um, language is this and all of those kinds of things. All these kinds of barriers will not be there. And so when we talk about the perfect worship, heaven will be the perfect worship the perfect worship experience. We will have the perfect voices in worshiping the Lord. Perfect voices in worshiping the Lord. So if now you can, we can't sing and you are not a good singer and all of that, well, we're going to all have perfect voices in worshiping the Lord. Okay, we'll be worshiping the Lord. So if you understand that heaven is not just going to be this kind of wishy-washy worship that we do on this earth right now under the guise of this um, frail body, which always sometimes you'll be worshiping and um, you are angry with somebody or we worship, we don't feel like it. You know, on this earth, when we worship, we worship when we feel like it. You know, and, and the Bible says that praise the Lord at all times. So praising God at all times, and then you are sitting there saying, but I don't feel like worshiping God and praising him at this time. You know, so there are so many barriers to what we call worship in this earth realm. But even at that, God still works through it by his grace. God works through that corridor with his grace to still be in our midst. Thank God for the grace of God. Thank God for the mercies of God. Because the height of worship, we have not even attained that level. We have not gotten to that realm. So we will be in the perfect version of ourselves, in the perfect environment with no sin, and worshiping God in a perfect level, in a perfect manner. When you read the book of Revelation, it is awesome what it states, especially sometimes when you look at Revelation chapter 4. And it says that the the... the the Lamb of God came before the, the Father. And when he came before the Father, he said, you sent me onto the earth, uh, and I went and I died, and I rose up again on the third day. And uh, I have I am worthy to take the scroll that is in your hand. And the Bible says that when the, when the Father uh, turned the, 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 the scroll into his hand, then the whole host of angels took up their harps and, and guitars and trumpets, and with one voice, they sang, to the Lamb. Holy, 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 holy is the Lord God Almighty. Riches and power, wisdom and strength. And they sang in unison. So in heaven, it's a, it's a perfect orchestra. It's not, there is no mistake. Perfect orchestra. 
There is no blemish. There is no blemish. There, there, there is no secondhand goods. It is, it is first hand. It is the best of the best. So if God says it's going to be, it's going to be done, it's going to be done. So sometimes we are limited and it's hard for us to picture it. And that is because we are limited in this um, realm that we live in under the fight with sin and, and Satan. So we are always under the constant battle with Satan, even trying to worship. So there are people that struggle in worship. When worship is going on, he's thinking about rice and beans. When worship is going on, he's thinking, oh, well, I can't wait to get home and just grill that uh, lamb chops and all of that, do my serious barbecue and sit at my backyard and enjoy some fresh air. Whilst worship is going on, that is what he's thinking. But in heaven, in eternity, there will be nothing like that to think. You are not going to be worrying about these kinds of things because we'll be the perfect version of ourselves. Satan will not be there to be whispering in your ears and trying to tell you, oh, you can't do this and you can't do that. And, you know, isn't, that, isn't it uh, crazy that the worship has been too long? The worshiper that is leading is too, he's, he's leading too long. He should just cut it off and let's get into other, other important businesses. You will not be thinking about that. Because there'll be no, you know, demonic influences coming around. There'll be no evil influences anywhere. We'll be in a perfect unified realm with God. Hallelujah. If you believe that and you want to be part of that, say a big amen. I will be part of that to the glory of God. Amen. We will be perfect. Uh, we'll have perfect voices in worshiping the Lord. Not only are we going to worship in heaven. Okay. We'll not only worship in heaven. We'll be busy doing the Lord's business in heaven. We'll be busy doing the Lord's business in heaven. We'll be, we'll be doing the work of God in heaven. Now, the work of God, I'm not talking about going to preach to souls. There will be, there will be no souls to be converted, but you'll be learning. We'll be busy learning about God and serving God in heaven. Okay. In, in Revelation chapter 7, verse 15, it says, Before the throne of God, serving him day and night in his temple, serving him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. So we'll serve. We'll serve before the Lord. We'll serve before the Lord. We'll be doing uh, the Lord's work, the Lord's business, the Lord's mandate. Do you know that when the earth was created and Adam and Eve were placed in the garden, uh, the Bible says that God did not send rain on earth because there was no man to work the ground. So the working on the grounds was an act of worship to God that I'm honoring you by the work, the strength you've given me in the garden to work for you. And it brings glory to God. So we'll not be sitting in heaven, just worship, 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 but we'll be busy doing the Lord's uh, business. What else would we be doing in heaven? Heaven is a place of rest. Yes, I believe that heaven is a place of rest. But also, it is a place of productivity. It's a place of productivity. So we're going to be productive. We're not just going to be uh, in heaven just sleeping. There are people that think that we're just going to be in heaven and sleep till our body aches. Uh, you know, and sleep and sleep and sleep and sleep and sleep and sleep and sleep. Because they read the Bible and they say, um, 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 Jesus will say, a good and faithful servant, come and have your rest. We are thinking we're just going to sleep and sleep and sleep and sleep and sleep. No. We're going to be serving God. That is productivity. Okay. Note this. The death for the believer is not the end of life, but a continuation of it in another place. So when we die, we are not dead, but we're going to have a continuation of life in another place. This one is a glorious version, powerful version, unbroken version perfected version. I want you to declare it. I will be part of that in Jesus' name. Declare it to the glory of God. So we are going to not just sleep and sleep and sleep and sleep and sleep and wake up and we sleep and we just see the glory of God. We sleep and sleep. No, that's how it's going to be. Okay. In heaven, we shall eat together. Now that side is very, very good. We will be eating in heaven. So uh, get ready because we're going to be eating glorious food. It's going to be, when I say glorious food, don't spiritualize it. <laughs> we're going to eat. We're going to eat in heaven. 
Okay, we're going to eat together. Uh, the Bible says the book of Revelation chapter 19 and verse number nine. Is that, and, and the Lord said to John, right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. So there is going to be a supper. There is going to be a supper or a dinner. You know, there are places they call it supper. There are places they call it dinner. So when we talk about dinner, you know, it's, it's more... Uh, formal, very formal. Everybody put on their best apparel. You know, you're going out for a dinner date. Uh, and 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 when you have weddings, they have a dinner, you know, dinner reception and everybody's dressed nicely. You know, those that weren't able to make it to the uh, actual wedding, they come for the dinner and nobody come there wearing jeans. You know, they come dressed, you know, because it's a dinner. So you put on your best and all of that. You're coming to eat and dance and all of that. So there is going to be a marriage supper of the Lamb. There's going to be a marriage supper of the Lamb. You remember I spoke about it, the, the, the marriage, the great wedding. That great wedding will be taking place in heaven whilst chaos is breaking out on the earth during the great tribulation. So in that, in that uh, uh, great wedding, um, these are some of the things that will be taking place. And when everything gets into eternity, the, the marriage supper of the Lamb continues. The marriage supper of the Lamb continues. When you go to family family homes and people are married and all of that, you know, you have uh, family dinners and all those kinds of things. That is how it is going to be. We're going to eat. That's That, that, that to me, I'm telling you, is, is wonderful. We're going to eat. So uh, if you don't like food, well, your upgrade version will love food. <laughs> Glory be to God. Hallelujah. And watch this. We shall also sit together with the great saints of old. We shall sit together with the great saints of old. The people we've read about in the Bible, we're going to be sitting with them. You know, at the dinner table, we'll be sitting with them and having a conversation with them. And you'll be saying, how is that possible? Well, let's check the scriptures. Matthew chapter 8, verse 11 says, and I say to you that many will come from east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. So we'll be sitting down and having a talk. And, you know, I, I can't wait to, 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 to ask um, John the Baptist, how did, how did the honey and the locust taste like? You know, and we'll be asking Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, how was it that, how did you feel in the fire? Did you feel roasted or you felt that, you know, everything was cool, you know? And I will ask uh, uh, somebody like Daniel, you know, when you, when you were fasting, was it really 21 days you were fasting or you were fasting for a long time? How long were you fasting for? You know, and me, I will ask uh, Moses like a personal question, like, how did you feel when, when the people were driving you crazy, did you, did you and at any point when, <laughs> you know, so there will be that time of uh, sitting together with the great saints of old. Okay, so it's not going to be that idea of boring place and this being boring and that being boring and everything's going to be boring in heaven as that idea that people carry all the time. But it's going to be, it's going to be wonderful. You know, you can ask, Peter, a question, hey, Peter, how did it feel um, when you were turned upside down and you, you got your head chopped off? Um, 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 uh, at that time, were you, were you fully persuaded? Or, or, or what, 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 what was your idea? But I mean, you get to ask a lot of questions. How was your time like? How was your, how was your times like? Because we will be having a conversation. So don't have the mindset that heaven is going to be a place that we all have dumb heads and not don't remember uh, anything, no. But we'll not have the consciousness of sin. We'll not have the conscious of, consciousness of wickedness or consciousness of, uh, uh, um, of standing against God. So we'll get to ask a lot of questions. We'll get to uh, speak with the great saints of old. We can get to talk to, to, to David, you know, how his kinship felt in his days, did he feel? Did he feel pressure? Can I speak to um, Samuel, you know, as a prophet of his days. You're going to meet all these great 
uh, men and women of God, like Deborah, you're going to be meeting all these great women and men of God or saints who stood in their times and in their generations for Christ, for God. So you have to have that in mind. But, you know, after all these, these things are said and done, we need to understand this. The main event in, in heaven is going to be being with Jesus. Being with Jesus is going to be the main event. You know, because we are married, the church is married with Christ. So there's going to be that being with Jesus Christ. It will be learning the ways of God. We'll be learning the, the mind of God, what God is about, and what that is the service that we'll be rendering heaven. So it's not going to be a boring thing. John chapter 14, verse 3 says, When everything is ready, Jesus said, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. You will be with me where I am. D.L. Moody said the other day that it is not the jeweled walls and pearly gates that are going to make heaven attractive. It is being, it is the being with God. So it's not the jeweled walls, it's not the, the, the streets of gold, it's not the pearly gates that is going to make heaven attractive. But what is going to make heaven attractive is we being with God. That is what it is going to be. Heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people. A prepared place for a prepared people. Jesus said that in my father's house, there are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. So when you are in a travel, you prepare as you, as you are traveling. I, I don't see anybody that is traveling, let's say, from, from Canada to, to Africa and then just going with empty hands, with no bag, nothing. You go, you go prepared. Some of us, we spend like three months preparing, buying stuff and all those kinds of things. So you don't know the number of years you're going to be on earth, but you have to always be prepared. Be preparing to meet the Lord. Be preparing and having heaven in view to spend in eternity. Be preparing. In, in, in your ways with God, standing with the Lord, but always be in anticipation, always be in preparation to meet uh, the Lord. Okay, because heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people, that means that we have to be heavenly minded and live to attain the glorious eternity which is in heaven. So when we are heavenly minded, we live to attain the glorious eternity, which is in heaven. Listen to me, people. Don't get distracted by what the world is saying and what the world is doing. And uh, those things are also part of the distraction Satan will use to get your mind off the most important things. So it is important to understand. Paul said something. He said, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And he said that I shall meet with the, with the, with the Corinthian, uh, the, the Thessalonican church in heaven. He, he was speaking of how they're going to meet. And when they meet, they will recognize each other. They will recognize each other. There will be a wonderful uh, uh, meal taking together. Food will eat food, according to scripture. There will be that. Okay. And we always have to have the heavenly mind as we are on earth. We always have to have the heavenly mind. Don't just live your life anyhow, just running around, just trying to get a house, get all those things are good. Don't get me wrong. But if your Christianity is just centered on these things, then you are a half Christian. You're not a full Christian. Because the full Christian is not just thinking about earthly things. He's thinking about eternity, the heavenly things. The heavenly things. So be heavenly minded, and that will that will um, help you to live to attain that glorious eternity, which is in heaven. In Revelation chapter twenty-two and verse number twenty to twenty-one, I leave you with this before I take your questions. It says he who testifies to these things says, "Surely, I am coming quickly." Amen. 
Even so, come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen and amen. You can respond by saying amen or typing amen. We thank God for tonight. This is all that we are going through all that we have been facing, all the challenges, all the tears, the pain, the victories, the ups, the downs, the weak moments, the strong moments, the fastings, the prayers, the going to church, the preaching of the gospel to those that are not saved. All these things is because we have heaven in view. All this is because we want to spend eternity in heaven with God. There will be no more tears, no more sorrows, no more sicknesses, no more pain, no more imprisonment, only joy unending, glorious experience on ending just a time which is timeless with our father in heaven god bless you god bless you now i'm going to open the floor if you have a question this is the time to ask your question what question if you have a question about heaven what 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 uh uh the question is please you can uh, sending your question, you can text it, uh, you can type it on Zoom uh, chat group, or you can type it on Facebook Live if you're on Facebook Live, and I'll be able to uh, uh, answer your question. Or if you're on Zoom, you can uh, lift up your hand uh, with the lifting hand tab there, and then the um, operator will give you the room to ask your question. Yes, so the, 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 the lines are open. If you have a question um, concerning what we have learned, um, you can ask your question. And note this, there is no um, crazy question or out of, out of uh, this word uh, uh, question. You can ask any question that is bothering your mind and we'll be able to answer that question for you. Okay, so somebody is asking, will we be able to have access to every room in heaven? <laughs> will we be able to access every room in heaven? Well, aside from um, heaven encounters by many people and all of that, we know that we can't raise anybody, any one person's experience of heaven um, above what the word of God says. So I think that is not as, as important of accessing a room in heaven more than accessing God and what we need to know or learn or serve in heaven when we get there, when we get into that time of eternity. So I don't think that it's something that we would have to um, be worrying ourselves about as to whether I'll be able to access a place, a heaven, um, uh, a door, a certain door or not. But as, as I'm saying, the scriptures is the foundation to everything that we study aside from everyone's experience with heaven. Uh, the Bible is our very foundation of what has been written. So when we get there, we will know. Anybody else have a question? Uh, 
Um, okay, somebody asked a question on Facebook. Um, saying, good evening, Pastor. I have two questions. On, my, on the Mount of Transfiguration, how did the disciples recognize who was with Jesus if both Moses and Elijah existed? Existed. Where, where am I? Okay. If both Moses and Elijah existed and died before, way before their time. Also, Revelation talks about the tree whose leaves are for the healing of the nations. But if we are already in a glorified body in heaven, why is a cure still necessary if there is no illness? Okay. That's why I said that when it, let me take the first, the first question of the transfiguration. I spoke about the essence of full knowledge, the full knowledge and clarity. So in that time of transfiguration, there was the full knowledge experience, which made them to be able to recognize Elijah and Moses. Because it wasn't, it wasn't of the fact that they were holding um, uh, anything like Moses holding the Ten Commandments in, in his hand. Okay, so they were they were they experienced uh, a glimpse of the full knowledge that we're going to have when we when we have the glorified um, <clears throat> body, the the, uh, the 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 perfect version. Now the second question with the tree of life, you have to note that in in the book of Revelation, um, not all of it are in the chronological system, in a chronological system. Now. What John spoke about, he saw what the tree of life represented for the earth now. So the tree of life is the person of Jesus Christ. Okay, is the person of Jesus Christ. Because the Bible says the tree of life supplies life to everything that was in the garden. Okay, everything that was in the garden, the tree of life uh, so, uh, gave that with the, with the, together with the river of life. So those are... Uh, those are the 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 the, the symbols or the, the 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 symbols for that matter that represented Jesus as the healer for the nations, not in the literal sense of having the tree of life in eternity for the cure of sickness, because there will be no sickness. There will be no sickness, and there will be no uh, death either. So there will be no sickness. So that scripture is pointing to the, the concept of the person of Jesus representation for the earth now. He is the healer for nations, for individuals, for every tribe and tongue. That means that when you come to God, you are healed from death and brought into life. You are, you are healed from the sicknesses of death and brought into the victorious uh, life of Christ. So that is what um, that side of the scripture is referring to. It's not referring to um, um, death, uh, what do you call it, sicknesses uh, in eternity. Okay. Any other question? Anybody has any question? There was somebody that asked a question, will we marry in heaven? Will we, will we marry in heaven? Will we, <laughs> will we reunite? You know, and, and the person that was asking that question um, um, uh, has gone through divorce. So in his mind, he's thinking, am I going to be reunited with that same person that I hated their guts and I don't want to be with and all? <laughs> uh, in heaven, uh, the Sadducees one time came to Jesus in the book of Luke, uh, in the book of Luke, I believe uh, Luke chapter number 20. And they tried to corner Jesus by asking him these kinds of ridiculous questions. And they said, uh, would we be marrying people when we get to heaven? And this is what Jesus said. Let's go to uh, Luke chapter number 20. Luke chapter number 20. I've seen a few uh, questions coming in. Uh, keep it rolling. That is good. Um, Luke chapter number 20, um, verse number 27. Give me a second. Um, Luke 20. 
Uh, the conversation starts from verse number um, uh, 27, but I want to pick it up from verse number 34. Bible says after they asked them that, right, they were asking, you, you using the uh, uh, Judaist uh, laws to try to corner Jesus because the Sadducees were people who believed in the resurrection. So they were trying to corner Jesus of how that is going to, uh, um, what do you call it, that is going to be in those uh, times. So this is what Jesus answered them and said, the sons of this age marry and are given in marriage. The sons of this age in this earthly realm, okay, are, are, are given in marriage. But those who are counted worthy to attain that age and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. So he's talking about in heaven, those who are going to attain heaven uh, they are not going to be given in marriage and all those things. So marriage in its sense, you need to understand there's going to be only one great marriage. That is the marriage of the, of the bride of Christ with the, with the groom, which is Jesus Christ. Because the earthly marriage is God's, uh, uh, is just a glimpse of God's sign of how uh, he wants to unify himself with man. How he wants to communion, uh, commune with man, and so Paul speaks about that by um, unraveling a revelation in the book of Ephesians, chapter number five, uh, where he speaks about um, um, husbands love your wife, uh, wives uh, submit to your husbands, and then he goes on. Then he says that I am not talking about you, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. Okay, so it is it, what we are experiencing now is just earthly, and it is till death do us part. You know, sometimes people ask these questions because maybe they lost a spouse, and they want to know that they will be able to reunite with them and continue their life that they had before. There will be no marriage in heaven. Okay, so that answers the question. Okay, somebody is asking uh, a question. After Christ resurrected, his disciples couldn't recognize him until he revealed himself to them. My question is, if his disciples couldn't recognize him after his resurrection, as he was in a glorified body, how are we going to be able to recognize our loved ones since we will have heavenly glorified bodies? They recognized him. The Bible never said they didn't recognize. They recognized him but they could not believe that it is him. Why? Because the ideology was that a person that is dead cannot be in their midst. Even though he said, I will, I will rise up again. I hope everybody can hear me. I hope everybody can hear me. Okay. He said, I will rise up again. I will rise up again uh, uh, on the third day. And he told them that. The Bible says they thought he was a ghost. So what did he do? He said, come to me and feel. Okay, feel me if I'm a ghost. The same thing with, with Philip. Philip had the same mindset. Philip had the same mindset. So we, we, we have to um, understand that on the concept of of them recognizing him, they did. One scripture um, writer narrates that in the, at the uh, Sea of Galilee, when he yelled and said, fellas, have you caught anything yet? This was when they have gone back to their, their you know, occupation, you know, doing their fishing business. And the Bible says that, and Peter recognizing that it is the Lord jumped into the water and swam to the shore. Okay, so we need to we need to know that they recognized him. They, they, it, it wasn't uh, in any form of them having an obscured face of a person who they knew before, but he has now a different you know head or a different uh, features. No, he had the same the same features, but an upgrade level. The Bible has very clearly stated it, that we will recognize our loved ones. 
There's a, another example that I made yesterday, uh, last week, when um, the, the rich man who was in hell was able to call Abraham and was able to call um, Lazarus. So he recognized them. So yes, you will recognize them. You recognize, I think I saw a question on YouTube, uh, sorry, on Facebook. Um, let me see if there's a, that's a question. Okay, so um, John encounters an angel in heaven. John encounters an angel in heaven and he tells him, he who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. Um, he who is holy, let him be holy still. If we are preaching repentance, why is this angel making this statement? Okay, so uh, you have to look at the context of the text. You see, it's always very important. You don't pick a side of it and um, expound on it. There is a story behind that scripture, that verse that, you just um, uh, quote it. Now, when you take it like this, and you're thinking that the angel is saying, um, be, he's saying that let the one who is unjust be unjust. Interpretation of the earthly realm at this time, you will misquote and misinterpret scripture. And when you interpret it like that, it disregards scripture, actually. It, uh, it negates the nature of God for salvation because God doesn't want people to wallow in their sin. So that is not the context of the text. If, if the context of the text is speaking on the grounds of what has already been done, which John was seeing as to what is taking place in that time in eternity, then that is how it's going to remain. Then the unjust will still be unjust. The righteous will be righteous. And, and the non-believer will go to hell, uh, um, will be in the lake of fire, and the believer will spend eternity with God. That will be the great, perfect way of interpreting that text. Okay? All right. Any other question? Anybody have any other questions? Yes. Pa Pastor, please. Um, I, I asked a question about the recognition of Christ. and mm -hmm. It's not very clear because in the book, 24 16, it talks about it sees that their eyes were kept from recognizing him uh, who is Jesus and he was walking with them and mm -hmm. he was asked and they were having conversation and he was asked and what is this people are talking about and because they didn't recognize him they said um, don't you know what has happened in Jerusalem Mm -hmm. And he asked them, yeah, "What are you talking happened? about? The people that were going to uh, on the road of um, on the on the road of Nain." Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's, um, and he told the, he asked them uh, what happened in Jerusalem, and mm -hmm. he uh, nar they narrated what happened to him, and then he revealed himself to them. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, you said that uh, uh, the scripture uh, said said something. It, it said like it, they it, they were not they were kept from recognizing him. Okay, what Until scripture was that? Revealed. I know that scripture, but I want us to go back to the scripture. To that text. Okay. Okay. Is it the road to Emmaus? Yes, please. Okay. Um, um, Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. And um, Verse number twenty, uh, verse number thirteen. Okay. 
Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked alongside with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. And he asked them, what are you discussing together? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem? Who does not know the things that, had, that have happened? What things, he asked, about Jesus of Nazareth? They replied, he was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priest and the rulers handed him over, okay, in verse number 21. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. Are you seeing that? We had yeah. hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. We had mm -hmm. hope. So that means that now that he is dead, there is no hope. Mm -hmm. Okay. When there is no hope, you lose your essence of recognition. Look at this. But we have, we have, a, we, we had hoped that he was going to, he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but did, didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah uh, have to suffer these things and then enter into enter his glory? Now watch this. Mm -hmm. It is very interesting you're asking this question, but you have to mm -hmm. see that the recognition, okay, mm -hmm. recognition, first of all, these individuals have lost hope. They have lost faith. So they are not expecting a resurrected, glorified body. So that in the first realm, that in the first realm becomes a blockade. Mm -hmm. Until he started, he started pointing them to that which has been spoken by the prophets. It says, and as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were, he were going further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to he give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. Why did they recognize him? In the natural frailties of their bodies, they could not believe that he will resurrect from the grave. Now, what we are talking about here is a glimpse of what they, what they saw that it is truly Jesus. What will happen when we go into eternity, it is in the upgrade of this frail body. Okay, it is the upgrade of this frail body. So according to scripture, we are going to be able to recognize every single person that we know, that we ever knew on this earth realm before we passed on, before we died. Let me put it in that terms. So now that we come into a glorified body, we are definitely going to, uh, we are definitely going to see and recognize him or recognize the people that we know, okay? At the day of ascension, they were all there. They saw him that this is Jesus. They didn't say that this was somebody else. They saw that this was Jesus. And they saw him ascend into heaven. And when they saw him ascend into heaven, the Bible says that one of the angels said, this same Jesus that you see go up, you're going to see him come back again. So you're going to recognize 
the person, any your loved ones, your family members. The scripture has made it very clear. So yes, we're going to see them. But the, in this text, you are speaking of it from a failed state. Even from a failed state, there was a point that they still recognized him. Okay, there was a point that they still recognized him in this failed state. But we're talking about um, um, going from this uh, dishonored seed of a body and coming into a glorified, perfected body. And it is the infusion of the natural with the supernatural, the natural that is the flesh with the supernatural. So we are able to see God. We are able to recognize everything. We, our, our intellect is not limited as we see now. Will not be limited. It would be, it would be clear. So there will be no fuzziness. There will be no days. Like you'll be in a daze and you will not, you will not recognize anything. So it is clear you will recognize one another, each other. Okay. So it's not, it's not just because they saw, they didn't recognize him right away, uh, negates the essence that we might, uh, we will not be able to recognize um, um, people when we get on to the glorified body. Note that even with these individuals, the they were not, they were still in this flesh. They were still in this limited flesh and they still saw him. They still recognized him. So note that even if it's in this <clears throat> and we are able to recognize him, we will, we will recognize each other in the glorified sense. In scripture. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. No, you're welcome. Okay, um, somebody say, is there an individual meaning to each of the stones mentioned <clears throat> pertaining to the foundations of the, of the new Jerusalem? Um, I think that when it comes to these, these uh, things, it's more of a curiosity. I want to know what exactly these stones mean. Uh, what we know from, from scripture as the the essence of these uh, uh, 12 stones of, of Israel representing the government of God. Now, we need to be more interested in uh, the things that we are going to be part of in doing in heaven. Okay, in part of doing in heaven. This um, question is a, is a great question. The foundations of the new, of the new Jerusalem uh, I'll be speaking uh, in the coming weeks. Next week, I'll be speaking about would some uh, would a believer be able to lose their uh, salvation? Can a believer lose their uh, salvation? I'll be uh, and I'll go into uh, symbols and tokens. So let's put this question more into symbols and tokens. When it gets there, where I will speak about the the symbols, the meanings of the feasts uh, as it, uh, it as it as it connects to. Um, heavenly activities and uh, the stones that were built into the um, the Jerusalem uh, um, uh, city of Jerusalem in heaven. So we'll be looking into all of that. Okay. So that that one that one we can hold on to that. We can hold on to that. Anybody has any other question? Everybody is good. Okay. All right, so I don't see any, any more questions. So I will let it be, uh, we're going to pray. We're going to pray. This has been an awesome, awesome, awesome uh, series. God richly bless everyone who contributed, who asked questions. Uh, those of you that didn't ask, ask your question. Um, don't, if you have a question that beats your mind, it's very important to ask uh, so that uh, you will get clarity uh, on that uh, question. Uh, that being said, uh, we're going to pray. We're going to pray. 
Uh, we've gone through the series of the end time, uh, end time, and um, we're going to pray for God's grace. We've heard about the things that are about to happen, the things that are yet to take place. And um, we, we want to be prepared, uh, especially having heaven in view. Uh, there are people that don't think after, about afterlife. Uh, we think that it is just here and now. And that is so limited of a mind to have. And um, those that are being lied to and being told that hell is going to be a great place of partying and, and unending booze and all of that, you will be shocked to know that it will be full of sorrow, worse than the word sorrow would be. So we want to pray tonight. Uh, I want you to join me in prayer as we pray together. Um, if you are in a, a place that you can unmute yourself and join in the prayer, that will be wonderful to join in the prayer as we pray together. Uh, we are praying that the Lord will grant us the, 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 the tenacity, the, the, the endurance uh, that we will know that everything that we face, everything we're going through, is we striving by heaven, heaven, uh, by having heaven in view. That is the reason why we're striving. That is why we are pushing. That is why we are plowing through. And so uh, I'm welcoming everybody. We're going to lift up our voice and pray and ask for God's grace, ask for God's strength in this very time that we'll be able to weather the storms, that will not be distracted. And if we're here and we feel so far away from God, that today we will come to the grace of God, set ourselves under the grace of God. Let us lift up our voice in prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus. 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 Name of Jesus. If you are in a place where you know you can pray, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray in the name of Jesus. And lift up prayer, Lord. And pure up the times that we live in the name of Jesus. We know that there is nothing new under the sun, and the enemy wants to eliminate us and corrupt us and us. Lord, I pray for my in the name of Jesus. It is my prayer, O oh God, that you will cover us under the auspices of your power and grace in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. I want us to pray once again. We are praying in the name of Jesus against every tactics of darkness. Satan is on the loose, trying to convince masses into darkness and plunging people into hopelessness. But we are praying in the name of Jesus Christ that the light of Christ will shine the hope of the Lord through us in this world that we live in, in the name of Jesus. Let the prayer right now. Let every agenda of darkness, raising up racial tension, bringing high levels of hate in, in, in the society today, coupled with the pandemic we are going through, men are stressed, people are under enormous pressure. The Lord will pray that Christ in us, being the hope of glory, will shine through us to the world in the name of Jesus. And every agenda of darkness, every plot of darkness, every plan of darkness, 
every propaganda of darkness to get us angry, get us uh, derailed, get us thinking hopelessly. Lord, that will not fall into that trance of darkness. In the mighty name of Jesus, your word has always been real. Your word has always been true. Your word has always been the force and the grounds of our covering. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that as the world is going through the things that it is going through, we still have the confidence that in our generation we will know more of God. That in our generation we will have more more of the glory of God, that in our generation, the church will not fail, that in our generation, the leaders will not fail, that in our generation, our spirituality will not go on vacation, that in our generation, that our joy and our passion for God will not wax cold in the name of Jesus. For there are only few that are just voicing the voice of darkness and making us think that the kingdom of darkness is taking over the world. The devil is a liar. But the light of God shines over the earth in the name of Jesus. For since the time of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of God suffered violence. But men of violence take it by force. Lord, we know that there is a great war going on in the spirit that is manifesting in the physical and trying to derail and trying to discredit the church and trying to undermine the glory of the church. But that harlot will never win. That power of the harlot, the propaganda of the harlot will never materialize it will never come to pass it will never stand in the name of Jesus Christ I come against the works of the harlot in the name of Jesus Lord you said in your word that you shall build your church and the gate of hell shall never prevail against it I pray in the name of Jesus any other devices of darkness using it to disrupt and discourage and pull down the hope and the faith of many but Lord we are not moved by sight we are not moved by what we hear, but we are moved by the word of God. We are moved by the word of promise. Let you promise that we shall be the head and not the tail in the name of Jesus. Irrespective of the calculations, irrespective of the of the statistics, I decree and I declare that we stand by the promise. For man will never fail in the name of Jesus Christ. In the mighty name of Jesus. I pray in the name of Jesus. We are lifting up one more time. We are lifting up prayer for our church. You are praying that the glory of God will continue to shine through the church. Through, through our doings, through our dealings, that the glory of God will shine through. The power of God will shine through. The love of God will shine through. In the name of Jesus, that will not be run over by the voices of the world. We will not be run over by opinion polls. We will not be run over by, by video propagandists. In the name of Jesus Christ, that we will be giving our minds, our hearts, our souls, the permission for the word of God to have precedence and preeminence over our life in the name of Jesus. Let that prayer right now declare in the name of Jesus. Father, we know there are, because of our technological age, there are so many ways that people can get to information so quickly. That makes the world uh, believe that the, the, the darkness is more greater than, than before. But there is nothing new under the sun. And Lord, I know that you are not surprised by anything that takes place on the surface of the earth, but you have confidence in us as children of God that will be the beacon of hope of the world today in the name of Jesus. I decree and I declare any propaganda, any secret propaganda to discredit the church, discredit men of God, trying to use that as a grounds for people to lose hope in the church, for people to lose hope in the leaders of the church, people that even call themselves men of God, people that even call themselves Christians, running their mouth on social media, being used as vessels in order to bring some discouragement and some opinions of men in the realm of the physical, discrediting the church without them even knowing they are discrediting the church of God and undermining 
undermining the glory of the, of the yes. church. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus, let that propaganda never stand in the name of Jesus Christ, but will always and forever by the glory and by the power of the Lord that is of which God is doing through the church of Jesus Christ on the earth realm. I thank you, God, for what you have done tonight. I thank you, Lord, that we have heaven in view. I thank you, Lord, that those of us that were far away from you, you have brought us close tonight. You have brought us back to, our, to, to you, oh God. We rededicate our lives to you. For many of us, oh Lord, our will rise higher than the will of God. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that tonight you have blessed your lives. It's your will to run our lives in the name of Jesus Christ. I thank you for what you have done tonight in the name of Jesus. I commit everyone that is tuning around the world into your hands. Lord, I pray that your glory and your grace will rest upon them in the mighty name of Jesus. Let your power rest upon them in the name of Jesus. Let the, let the spirit of empowerment and encouragement be their portion in the name of Jesus. Not to give their mind, their soul, their heart, their, their ears to, to the popular opinion and the, and, and the depression of the world, but they will give it to you, O oh God, by hearing the promises you have for us, even in these times that we live in. We give you all the praise. We give you all the glory for what you have done tonight. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. Amen. God richly bless you, beloved, for tuning in tonight. It has been an awesome time uh, for this 10 episodes. Please, it will be available on our, our, our YouTube channel. Uh, I welcome you, please. If you have not uh, subscribed to our YouTube channel, please uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's LRCC Ministries 1. LRCC Ministries 1 on, on YouTube. So when you go to YouTube, you type that, you'll be able to subscribe and you click on the bell beside it so that anytime that we bring a new content, you'll receive a notification. If you're also on Instagram, I'm on Instagram. I want to connect with you. I want to connect with you. I'll be doing some live um, 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 broadcast, live preaching, live encouragement uh, on Instagram. So if you're on Instagram, I want you to uh, follow me, uh, Pastor Kofi Yev, on, on, on Instagram. Or type my name on Instagram. You'll be able to uh, find me in order to follow me. And uh, you'll be able to uh, receive a notification when I come on live. It will just be about 10, 15, 20 minutes that I'll be praying for people. Uh, I will be bringing a word of encouragement. That is what we need at this time. That is the times that we live in. The Bible says that where there is darkness, God brought light. Let there be light. And there was light. God richly bless you. Tomorrow we are on the prayer line. Please don't forget. Tomorrow we are on the prayer line, 10 p.m. to 11 p.m. And we have a special guest uh, coming on Friday um, from 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. Uh, to, to bring uh, the infallible word of God, the person of Apostle Isaiah Hans is going to be with us uh, live on Friday from 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. Please tune in, uh, and I know that your life will never be the same. If you have an offering you want to give to the Lord, glory be to God. God richly bless everyone who is giving to support the work of God. Never stop giving just because it is a pandemic or whatever. Give it to the glory of God. The Lord will bless you. Shalom, everybody, and may the Lord bless you and empower you. If you missed any of this series, please go back to our what, um, YouTube channel and you'll be able to watch it again. God bless you and have a glorious and fruitful and empowering, encouraging week. God bless you. Shalom everybody. God bless you.